Okay, let me just start out, and as I say, anytime you have a question, feel free to indicate. Somebody will hand you a mic, ask your question. It's helpful if you indicate who you are and what town you represent, because as I've said before, context sometimes generates my, uh, 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 makes a difference on my answer. Yes, sir. In the last meeting we had, the question come up, a lot of the cities are going with a paperless agenda, doing away with the paperwork. So everybody is using laptops. And they said texting is not a good idea, but they didn't say if it was, you know, against the code. But, I mean, while you're sitting there with your paperless uh, iPad and somebody texts you or, or calls you and you, you got to read, well, I don't know, if is that going to be illegal? Well, you've asked a lot of questions there. Let me just say, I don't know what they mean by paperless agendas, but I will tell you that you will have minutes that are on paper and you will have an agenda on paper to comply with the state law. Your paper minutes are the official record and your paper agenda that is generated is the official record. And so you're at least going to have one copy of those. Now, if you're, what they mean by paperless is that when they send it out to, uh, to uh, the council members that they're not delivering them a paper, they're just delivering it on the iPad and all that and the packet, that's all right. <coughs> on meetings, sometimes, you know, they can use a, re they can use a ream of paper. Well, that's right, and, and that's becoming very common, and it's very handy. Uh, that's really not a legal issue. You know, you're going to have a written, uh, a paper record of the meeting until they change the state law on that. The written record is the official record. Now, as to the texting question, that's a very interesting question, uh, and I don't know how it works out for you. Uh, texting's important in the open meetings law because they allow you to text your constituents and each other's outside the public meeting, but the law says that you can't text other members of the public body during the public meeting. I've always told people that it is rude and inappropriate for a council member during a meeting to be texting people who are in the audience. I, but that's not technically illegal on the Open Public Meetings Act. It just seems kind of rude and inappropriate. But it may be the best way if somebody in your, in your audience wants to communicate with you without interrupting the meeting as well. It's just going to have to be up to you. But paperless, is it? What about texting the council member? Ask him how you're going to vote. During the meeting? Yeah. That is inappropriate, not allowed under the Open Public Meetings Act. Yeah, there's another question back there. While they get the mic, let me just uh, talk just generally about powers and duties. When we talk about duties, the primary thing to me is to talk about, or powers, I should say first, the primary thing to me is to talk about what powers? Who gives them to us? Where do they come from? You need to look to understand the whole picture, the broad spectrum of things. It's interesting for us in city government, in local government, because, you know, contrary to what some think, God didn't give you this power. English common law didn't give you this power. Uh, natural rights of man didn't give you whatever power you've got. Whatever power you have is given to you by the state legislature in the mun municipal code. And whatever power that is, is granted to you by the interpretations of our courts on what that code says and is. And the limitations on your power are what are important. You're limited to what has been granted to you, and of course by our state constitution and our federal constitution and on uh, some federal statutes and state statutes. But it's important to start with in general, when we think about our power as local government, our power as a government official, it's derived power, it's delegated power, it's power that comes from a code section, it's power that comes from a court decision, it's power that is limited by those natural rights of man and the Constitution and those kind of things. It's not granted by that. And so very often we get caught up, and appropriately so, with this idea that, that what we have as a local official, what we have as power, what we have that has some other source other than just that book, that Title X, just that uh, what the legislature does. 
And so what I want to emphasize, at least with the power, is how we understand that source of power and how we apply that power and what it is for you. Now the question here. Okay, kind of going off of what was asked, with social media and Facebook and those becoming more popular, if three or four council members are carrying on going back and forth debating an issue on Facebook, is there a problem, I mean, what's your view on when that type of thing occurs? Well, that's, uh, that's a good question. Let me, let me just say that's an open Public Meetings Act question. Happy to answer it. Uh, the Utah Open and Public Meetings Act uh, requires that all of your deliberations and your decisions be taken in a public meeting. And then the Act specifically says, defines what we def call electronic communication. And that includes things like emails, Facebook, text conversations, those things. And for whatever reason, the legislature in the Act has said electronic communications between council members is not a violation of the Open Public Meetings Act unless you're doing it during the meeting itself. So from a pure legal standpoint, is it illegal for council members to communicate three, four, five outside the meeting through Facebook, email, you know, argue and that. I can no longer, I used to tell people that that was illegal until the legislature, I think it was in uh, 2011, amended that to add that in. I can no longer tell you that that's illegal. The legislature said it is not illegal. What I can tell you is it appears to me to violate the spirit of the Open and Public Meetings Act if, in fact, what you're doing is deliberating and deciding outside the meeting. Now, only you will know if what you're doing is deliberation on a pending issue. Only you will know is what you're de doing is deciding, making deals on, on, a, on a pending issue. But there's a lot that you can communicate outside the meeting that isn't deliberation or deciding. It just may be politics. It just may be arguing. It just may be reporting to each other. It just may be responding to constituents' questions, and that's cl clearly appropriate and all right. But I can't tell you that that kind of thing is illegal under the Open and Public Meetings Act. Because as I said, we're restricted and empowered by what the state legislature does. State legislature said, this is why we define a meeting. This is what a violation of the Open Meetings Act is. Does it cause any other problems if they are at that point disclosing how they're planning on voting and putting that in the middle of the Facebook type? Doesn't cause any problems for me, did it for you? <laughs> you see, and that's why context is important. Let me just say this. You are talking to someone that has never looked at a Facebook. I learned your text last week. <laughs> I'm still not sure what Twitter is. But I understand that the world works differently than that. Telling, if someone called me up and I was on a city council and they said to me, how are you going to vote on that issue next week? And I said to the person that called, you know, I think I'm against it. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Now, if someone email me, email me the same question and also email every member of the council and I hit reply all, and I reply the same way I would on the phone, I don't think I'm in favor of that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. Uh, it's just communication with constituents. But if I am using social media as a way of avoiding, deliberating, and deciding in public, of hiding, of of trying to do the hard thing in secret, then I think there's something wrong with it. If I'm doing it, the, the thing openly, giving information, I clearly don't think there's anything wrong with that. Does that make sense? So when I draw the line, with, when people ask me, when they say, can I do that? I say, why do you want to do it? If the answer is, I want to do it because I want to make this deal without being yelled at by a room full of people, then I worry about it. But if you say, why are you doing it? You say, well, because I'd like everybody to know where I stand. The policy of the state of Utah is transparency. If it's a transparent kind of thing, it 
gives information to the public, you're probably all right. If you're doing it to hide information from the public, you're probably wrong. Y yes? It's, be it's been explained to me through uh, the county that any time uh, one of our commissions or boards or whatever have a quorum present, that that falls under the Open Meetings Act and it has to be properly noticed and published. Now, if you have, for example, five people on Facebook, and that constitutes a quorum for whatever that committee or commission is, does that not fall under the Open Meetings Act? My answer is no. And let me just say I am going to shift gears slightly and do this. All our questions have been on the Open Public Meetings Act. I am going to go right into the Open Public Meetings Act right now. It will save us time tomorrow. Let me tell you, the Open and Public Meetings Act is the section of state law that applies to every governmental body the same. They haven't written an Open Public Meetings Act for the legislature, then a different one for towns, and then a different one for counties. It's the same for everybody. And what the Open and Public Meetings Act says is this. It first says, this is the policy of the state of Utah. The policy of the state of Utah is that you will take your decisions openly and your deliberations openly. That policy statement is important for this reason. If there's a dispute that comes up and this ever gets into court, the courts have looked at that policy statement and said, look, the legislature has taken the time to tell us why they are adopting these regulations. The purpose behind our regulations on open and public meetings is to make our deliberations public and our decisions be taken in public. So on all close cases, that have gone to the, up to the courts, the courts have found in favor of openness. The courts have ruled in favor of transparency. So if it is a close case, you're going to go in favor of openness and transparency. What the Open and Public Meetings Act does to talk to, specifically to this gentleman's question is first, it defines what a meeting is. And it says a meeting is the convening of a public body. And then it defines the word convening. Convening is defined to be the calling together of the public body by the person who has the authority to call the meeting. And then it defines public body. Public body is defined to be a body consisting of two or more persons that has, that has been created by ordinance, statute, constitution, resolution, some kind of official act that's supported by public funds and has the authority to do the public's business. So in order for it to be a meeting, as you've described, it needs to be the quorum of the public body convened in a meeting. And then they define out what isn't a meeting. A meeting is not a social gathering, a chance meeting. So on your particular question, five people happened to be together on Facebook at the same time. Was it convened? Probably not, unless the mayor or the chairman said, let's all get together on Facebook at 3.30 today and discuss this. If they did, it is a meeting. If they didn't convene it, it's not a meeting. Is there a quorum present? That's your question. Quorum is defined by the state law for your town, cities and towns to be a specific number in the six member council forms of government. The quorum is three council members. In the five member council form, the quorum is mayor and two council members. And uh, those of you who might be in a seven member council, uh, if there are any there, the quorum is uh, four. Your planning commission, your quorum is defined by your own ordinances. So if you've got a body created by statute, your councils all are, or by resolution or ordinance, that has two or more people on it, and you convene together to do the public's business supported by public funds, you are required to comply with the Open Public Meetings Act. 
Fortunately, it's easy to comply with the Open and Public Meetings Act. All you have to do is two things. You have to appropriately notice up your meetings, and you have to allow the public to come into your meeting. The notice required under the Open and Public Meetings Act is at least 24 hours before your meeting, you have to publish and post a notice that includes an agenda of the meeting. You post it on the state public notice website. You post it at the place of the meeting. You send a copy of that to a news media outlet. And that agenda has to be specifically definite enough that someone reading it will know what you're going to discuss and decide. If you've done that, you've done the appropriate notice. Now, in addition, by the way, for those of you who hold regular city and town council meetings, you're required, or planning commission meetings that are scheduled on a regular basis, you do annually a notice of your annual meeting schedule that just says, you know, we meet on the, at this schedule. Okay, you've done your notice then. Then the only other requirement of the Open Public Meetings Act is that the doors be open and that the public be allowed to watch you work. That's it for the Open and Public Meetings Act for public participation and public notice. Now, the problem was with the social media things you pointed out, it overtook the Open and Public Meetings Act in some ways. It became easy to get together by Facebook, easy to get together by conference call, easy to get together by email, easy to get together by Twitter, I guess. So when that issue came up, as I said, the Open and Public Meetings Act applies to everybody the same. It applies to the legislators. It applies to state government. When that came up, uh, people started to say, look, there's a quorum on Facebook. There's a quorum on email. We think they're violating the act. The legislature decided the way to handle that was to define electronic communication, put in a section in the state act that says, Nothing in this act shall be, uh, shall be used to uh, uh, say that a public official has violated the act through the use of electronic communication unless you're doing it during the meeting itself. So in theory, feel free. It's not a violation. But back to what I originally said, keeping in mind the policy and the purpose of the act, keeping in mind our desire to uh, comply as best we can with the, with the public's need for transparency, you will know if you're using that as a way to cheat, don't do it. Yes, uh, Attorney Smedley, by the way, right here, who is the smartest man in, uh, <laughs> in the city attorney business, because right now the city attorneys are meeting and he's here. <laughs> That's right. Uh, just to follow up on that, I think, and just correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the, the good rule of thumb is it may be discoverable. So it goes back to your point, too, that don't, don't do anything in those meetings that that, uh, that this was from your training probably four years yeah. ago. Yeah. It, it could be discoverable. Yeah, this is the thing. Uh, let me tell you the downside of trying to use all the exceptions to make your life easier the temptation is to make hard decisions in private. The temptation is to make deals in private. It's to, it's to make agreements in private. Because, uh, because, frankly, what we've done in the Open Public Meetings Act is we have traded efficiency for transparency. It's harder to make a decision. It takes longer to make a tough decision. It's messier to make a tough decision. It's inefficient to make a tough decision in public. It's easy to make one in a back room. But we've traded that efficiency for transparency. So there is a temptation to be efficient. And then, so then we look for ways around the Open Public Meetings Act to get things done better. My advice to you, as Mr. Smedley says, is to avoid that temptation because if it really is controversial or it's really going to come out or really going to cause a, a contention in the community, and you get involved in a court proceeding on it, they're going to find out and discover that you did it anyway. They're going to know what it is. People are going to get the Facebook records. People are going to get the emails. And then you're going to be made to look bad. And we all know the number one rule for politicians is what? 
I don't want to look bad. <laughs> yes. You mentioned uh, the six uh, council mem uh, members. We have a five council members and a mayor, correct? You, uh, I don't know what city no, are you from. Eureka. Yes. Okay. So does three mean if the mayor is there and two council members, we can still conduct business? Or does it have to be three council members? Okay, excellent question for uh, the six-member council form of government. If you've got a mayor and five council members, your quorum is three council members. Mayor and two is not a quorum. You can't conduct business. You can't get anything done. Then on the plus side of it is it's also not an official meeting. Mayor and two in a town is a quorum. Mayor and two in a, in a, uh, in a six-member council form of government is not a quorum. Okay, thank you. I, that's what I thought. Yes. Hi, Michelle Weeks Draper. New, I'm new on the council, so I just have a couple questions. Um, when I was running for office last year, Geneva was a big issue, and the council would say that they couldn't s say whether they were for or against the expansion of Geneva because of lawful issues. Well, Geneva is now another big issue out there in Draper. They want to expand a little bit further. I have people asking me how I feel about the zone change. Can I tell them if I have facts about how I feel about the zone change, or? Uh, you can tell them whatever you want to tell them. Somebody elected you. You're an independent person. You're a, you're a free agent. Now, should you? I don't know. I, mean, I don't know I what you to want what, to tell them. I mean, I listen to what Geneva says, but, you know, should I wait until I am actually on the stand to hear both sides, or? Whatever you think best, but I advise you to, f if this is a, like a contested litigation issue and your attorney's giving you advice to keep your mouth shut, then my advice to you is follow the advice of your attorney. If this is just a hot political issue and you're a politician and somebody advises you to keep your mouth shut, I would say, hey. It's free. I, I got elected to express my opinions and gather facts, and I will. But that's up to you. I don't know what the issue is in, uh, in, um, in Draper when you say Geneva, other than I know that those, some of us uh, love gravel, and we don't live by the pits. <laughs> and Draper, I understand but the But if it's just a simple zoning issue, and there's right. no legal ramifications behind it, then I can yeah, and you're, my and you're at any time. Sure. Voice it if somebody asks you. Okay, Write thanks. an article in the newspaper. <laughs> Send in an op-ed. Go on Facebook. Do all those things. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm Damon Kemp from North Logan City. Uh, I wanted to ask, we, we've been looking at doing some things with senior housing. Oh, uh, good for you. I'm now 65 years old next <laughs> month. <laughs> We'd love to have you in North Logan. Uh, but uh, um, some, we, we've had some, some conflicting advice about what the do's and don'ts are, whether we can assign different densities if it's senior housing within the same zone or different building types and some of those sorts of things. I wonder if you could comment a little bit about what uh, laws and regulations apply to senior housing and whether it's okay to give <coughs> preferential treatment to senior housing relative to standard housing that goes in in the same area. Well, that's a more difficult question than I'm competent to answer. But let me just tell you that I do know that under federal law, under the Fair Housing Act and the HUD guidelines, they have carved out an exception to the normal rules that say that you can't discriminate based on age in housing to allow you uh, developers, and by extension cities who are approving developments, to discriminate in favor of senior housing in some ways if you can fall within their safe harbor rules. And you've probably seen those that deals with being 55 or older and less than 80 percent and all those things. So the short answer is yes, there are ways to discriminate in favor of senior housing. As to your specific question, uh, I can't say I'm shocked that you've get, been getting competing advice or competing opinions from planners and engineers and attorneys or city managers. By the way, that reminds me, I was playing golf with a city manager the other day, and this is on point on this, and we're in one of those scramble kind of things. And you know, you hit a shot, you all go, and so we've got this long putt, and I'm on his team, and I'm standing by the hole, and he's down by the thing, and he says, which way do you think this breaks? And I said, I think it breaks that way. And he said, well, it looks like it goes that way. And I thought, huh, 
I guess he doesn't know up from down. And then I thought, but yeah, he's a city manager, so, uh, you know. And then the next guy hit a putt, and it broke that way. And then it was his turn, and he hit the putt, and it also broke that way, but he hit it planning that it would break that way. And I thought, not only does he know up from down, but when you tell him, he won't believe you, and when he has actual knowledge, he won't believe you, because he'd already looked at it and made up his mind. And that's the way the world works. There will be an opinion different from every opinion you ever get that somebody is convinced is right, and you will not change their mind on them, and they're not going to change your mind on what you're doing. Right? That's the purpose of the Internet. It's to give bad, uh, give, <laughs> is to provide a basis for bad opinions. <laughs>